It's been a great year for the stock market, but it's been a terrible year for the economy. How does that make sense? Well, let's find out from Frances Donald. She is Managing Director, Global Chief Economist, and Global Head of Macroeconomic Strategy for Manulife Investment Management. And Brian Milner, freelance business and economics writer, both of whom join us from the provincial capital tonight. And it's good to see you two again. I, I want to, I guess, start by saying we want to consider, obviously, the differences between the stock market and the economy. And let's, for the purposes of this discussion, Francis, to you first, say that when we talk about the markets, we're talking about the Dow Jones, we're talking about the S&P and the uh, TSX uh, here in the provincial capital. So with that in mind, what's the significance in particular of those three markets apropos our discussion tonight? Well, generally, most of the time when you turn on your TV and hear about the markets, people are usually referring to the S&P 500, which is by far the largest index. It is U.S. based. It's 500 very large U.S. companies, what their stock performance did that day. Now, if you're talking about Canadian markets, you're usually referring to the TSX. That's 60 Canadian companies, what they, they did on that day. And then the Dow Jones historically referenced more often, but a little bit less lately. Uh, that's 30 big companies. And of course, every one of those markets is going to behave somewhat differently. They have different companies inside of them. And they, of course, have different sectoral weight, which sectors we're talking about will vary quite a bit among all of those three markets. And Brian, following up on that, if you check those 60 companies that are on, for example, the TSX, that is supposed to give you a broad general consensus understanding of what the economy is doing in this country? Is that the idea? Well, in theory, but the fact is that the Canadian market and the TSX, of course, is the Canadian market, is really mostly resource stocks and financial stocks. So if you assume that Canada is strictly governed by those two sectors, then yeah, it's, it reflects the economy. But of course, Canada is much broader than that and much bigger than that. And uh, you know, these these uh, sectors might be doing very well when the rest of the economy isn't. It, it's not really correlated that strongly. It certainly hasn't been for a long time. Well, Francis, is the stock market supposed to be an indication of the health of the economy in general? Well, no. And sometimes it, get play it gets played that way because the better the economy is doing, the better companies will do. I have two roles. I'm both an economist and a strategist. And the reason I'm employed by people who manage money is to give you a GDP forecast. How will the economy do? Why? Because over the long run, that's our best guess of how companies' earnings will do over that period. So there is a relationship between them. But what we have to remember is that really the companies within our markets are not the same division as they are over our economy as a whole. So typically, you're not going to find people saying, well, the economy is doing well. I'm going to invest in the TSX. You're going to hear people more saying, I like Canada's energy sector. Therefore, I will buy energy stocks. Now, that's not to say that there's nowhere to invest in Canada if you want to make a play on the economy. Usually, our Canadian bond market and the Canadian dollar have a much closer relationship than the stock market. There is a link. But it's really not as simple as saying the stock market is the economy. That's just not factually what's happening here. No, for sure. And, and Brian, maybe you could follow up in this regard. You know, the, the, one could understand the public being confused about that because on the one hand, they see the markets doing reasonably well. And on the other hand, we just experienced the, the biggest shrinking of the Canadian economy on record since StatsCan started keeping records almost 60 years ago. Why is there such a large disconnect at this particular juncture? Well, because the, the drivers in the market, especially in the U.S. market right now, are, are the big tech giants, and there are five or six of them, and, and they're dominating uh, market conditions, uh, and people are betting heavily on them, I, I would say too heavily, on the fact that they're innovative, they've done very well even during the pandemic, and that their prospects in the future uh, still look terrific, because they basically have monopoly power in their sector. Uh, that is not the economy. Uh, if you look, in fact, even at the S&P 500, which is supposed to be a fairly broad index, uh, the five biggest companies in that index are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet. Uh, those are the, you know, and Facebook, those are the giant companies. They account, those five companies account for about a fifth of, of the entire S&P earnings. So, so it's not balanced, and that doesn't tell you very much about how the, how the economy as a whole is doing. You know, how we know that retail is struggling, energy stocks are in trouble, 
Uh, we know that uh, the bulk of the economy is not doing nearly as well as these five tech giants. In which case, Francis, why don't the people who run these exchanges feel more of an obligation to include companies that are more representative of what the, the broader economy is actually doing? Well, they may have the push towards doing that, especially because this representation has changed so dramatically. But let's also remember that the companies listed in, let's say, the S&P 500, they're really biased toward manufacturing sides of the economy, industrial and tech, whereas the things that affect your and my life on the day to day, things like services and jobs are not represented there. So I'm not sure that we need to say we need to change the system. What we need to do is recognize that when someone says buy a diversified portfolio, buy the S&P 500, sure, it's more diversified than buying one stock, but a fifth of what you own is big tech. So what we have to do first is really disabuse ourselves of the notion that when you buy an index, you're buying the broad economy. You certainly are not. Like I said, if you want to make a big bet on what you think the economy is going to do, zero in on why you think that's going to happen. Now, I will say on the flip side that if you had told me before, back in January, we're going to have a really bad pandemic and everyone's going to have to stay home and do their interviews with the agenda over their phone using high-end internet, they're going to have to work from home, buy their groceries online, what would I have invested in? I would have bought tech stock. It makes perfect sense. In the United States, I would have bought healthcare stocks, which are 15% of that index. Are we really saying that, sure, there's probably a divide between what these companies should be and what they shouldn't? But effectively, it makes a lot of sense to, I think, most people that tech companies and those that are affiliated with a pandemic and work from home are doing really well. And those like airlines and casinos are doing really poorly. When you put it in terms like that, does it really seem so disconnected? No, that makes perfect sense the way you've just described it. But then, um, OK, well, Brian, why don't you help us by... Uh following up and track sort of the development of the tech stocks on the markets, how they have changed the composition of the exchanges over the last, let's say, three decades. What have you seen? Well, it's really, it's much more recent than that. I mean, we, we saw the tech boom in, in the 90s, uh, which collapsed. But in the 90s, uh, the S&P uh, was a much broader index. It had different sorts of companies in it. And these tech giants, uh, did, hadn't reached the level they have today. And, you know, we're talking now, two of them are trillion-dollar companies. That wasn't the case 30 years ago. Uh, but over the last decade, they've increasingly become more and more dominant. And once they entered the, the Dow Jones index, they began skewing that index as well in the same way. But if you leave them out, then you're leaving out the key drivers of, of the current market. Okay, just out of curiosity, which are the $2 trillion companies? I, I think I can guess them, but I don't want to... I'm afraid to look very, very stupid right uh, now, so well, maybe right you should now, just tell Apple us. And, uh, Microsoft and Amazon sort of varies around there, but it's, they're all pretty close. Hmm. Okay, good. Um, all right, let's try this. H how, you know, if the tech companies, uh, Francis, if they make up a disproportionately large share of the value in the market, but a, a sort of disproportionately smaller share of the number of employees in the market right now, what does that do to our understanding of the connection between the exchanges and the value of the economy? Well, it should just reinforce that the stock market is not the economy, or put differently, that the stock market represents a share of the economy. And I'll give you one example. Now, in the S&P 500, we got about 50% of the market cap and earnings in the S&P 500 comes from the manufacturing sector. And yet manufacturing is only 10% of the U.S. economy and less than 10% of jobs. Now, what's so critical about the current environment is the nature of the COVID-19 recession was such that it really hurt services and it didn't hurt manufacturing to the same degree. So the part of the stock market that represents that manufacturing economy can do really well and deserves to do really well, whereas what's really weighing on the economy is not as well represented in the stock market. So this disconnect, which historically didn't exist to the same extent because the recession would hurt all sectors, now is really being widened out by the nature of this recession here. One thing you might want to consider is if you're thinking about a sector, let's say you're really nervous about tech, Maybe you want to move away from the U.S. market, which is more tech-based, and move towards a Canadian or European market. They have much lower weights for the tech sector. So this is really encouraging a lot of conversations with my clients to think about if you have a thesis 
which index best represents it because they vary internationally and they can even vary within a country. Yeah, Brian, I want to understand that disconnect even further because, uh, you know, back in the day, an investor would take a look at a, a range of stocks and they would say, oh, that one there. OK, I, I, that looks undervalued to me. They're, they're not making a lot of profit now, but I think they could be in the future. So I'm going to bet on that one, invest in that one. And if it took off, great, you did well. Now there are companies, in fact, you know, some of the most valued companies on the exchanges, not only don't make a profit, but have never made a profit. Uh, Tesla, for example, which is, um, you know, valued at many, 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 many more times the, uh, their profitability or what their assets reflect. Can you help us understand why that makes any sense? Well, if you're talking about Tesla, it actually doesn't. Uh, because what you're buying with in, in Tesla is, is the promise that, that Elon Musk can create a company that has a moat built around it, to use Warren Buffett's famous phrase. In other words, the competition can't touch it. It's going to have a huge edge in the market. And because the market is going to go more and more toward electric vehicles, plus the other things that, uh, that Elon Musk is involved in, well, that's great. Then you're getting a piece of that business. Uh, the problem is that other companies are entering that space. Some of them are just as good at car making as Tesla is, uh, and some of them will, will copy Tesla. So therefore, where's the moat and where's the long-term value? Uh, there's a very famous uh, hedge fund manager named David Einhorn, uh, famous for his shorting, his bets that companies will go down. And he has a huge bet against Tesla which for the last while has been looking pretty bad because Tesla's stock has gone through the roof. Uh, but longer, t longer term, if you're, if you're as wealthy as he is and you can hang on long enough, then you'll probably be right. So Francis, should we think of the markets rather than investing in companies that are profitable as investing in companies that we figure someday might or should be profitable? Well, a lot of that depends on your investment timeline. Are you willing to invest in a company and wait five, 10 years for that to materialize? Effectively, what we're discussing here is something that a lot of investors are challenged with, which is intangible assets. How do you value the part of the company that you can't specifically count? Sometimes we feel good about a company or we have hope for it. You know, just like maybe when you were a teenager, you liked someone who didn't have a job and lived in their parents' basement, but there was just something about them that you really felt like had potential. People feel that way about companies as well. And that's the part of it that becomes part, such a part of everyone's discussion is intangible elements of it. How do you value those? And they really come down to opinions along the way. So big bets on intangible parts of companies, that really makes me nervous as an investor. I want to count things and be able to put things in a row and say, this is the real value of the company. Uh, but some people are willing to make those types of bets. You, you really have to have a long time horizon and a lot of risk appetite in order to do that. Well, Brian, I've talked to sports fans who say, you know what? If you bet on the market, you're a sucker. No one understands the game. And, um, and, and I'd rather just, this person was telling me, said, I'd rather just bet on sports. I really know a lot about the NFL. It's, it's, it, it, it behaves and is predictable in a way that I better understand. And if I have to invest some money, why not invest in sports betting as opposed to the uh, the exchanges. What do you make of that reasoning? <laughs> well, the fact is uh, you would have been doing much better if you had put your money in the markets, uh, even even during the worst of the, of the downturn. Uh, uh, your returns would be a lot better and a lot safer than, than uh, sports gambling. But that doesn't mean you're not gambling when you're in the marketplace. And if you're gambling on really speculative stocks, and Tesla, I think, is one of them, then you're making a bet. You're making a, a bet that the future is going to unfold the way Elon Musk tells you it will. And if it's right, then you do very well. You can even do well if you buy it at a reasonable price, watch it go up, and then get out. Uh, and uh, in sports betting, uh, you know, the odds are never in your favor in any kind of gambling. And I don't think the stock market's much different than that. The experts in the market always have an advantage over you and me. Uh, the insiders certainly have a much better advantage. Uh, that is the same in betting. Uh, and there are some people who say the market is more rigged than the sports uh, betting scene. <laughs> but uh, uh, the problem is that 
unless you have a long-term horizon, you are speculating. If you're a day trader, you, you're just like going to the casino. It's no different. Francis, I should get you on the Tesla. Well, if you want, Francis, you can tell me who to bet on for the Super Bowl this year. But per perhaps, um, perhaps I should ask you what you think about the Tesla bet. Oh, well, I'm a macro strategist, so my game is to think about longer-term themes, then dive into which countries do best in them, and then go down into each individual stock. If you're asking me to make bets on the long-term shift in consumer behavior, I'd be more likely to say to you, you know what, governments are going to be spending a lot more money on green programs, and there's a lot of companies that will benefit from that. That might change the stock market and the composition of it. It may also change the bond market and the currency. So Sometimes we need to push ourselves away from individual companies and ask ourselves, what is going on with the large thematic picture? That allows us to take a step back and properly assess whether this company is part of that longer term view. And you know, this is a really key messaging here is that we've had the spectacular run up in the equity market that we're unlikely to see on an ongoing basis. We should not get used to that. What we have to do is think about ourselves on a one year, three year and five year basis or longer and allow our long term investments to perform for us over that period. It means stay invested. Don't get, up, get caught up in the everyday volatility. Focus on your long term investment goals. Gotcha. OK, you two get comfortable for a second because this next question is going to require a bit of setup and this is going to take a few seconds. The economy, of course, is now essentially global. There are massive amounts of wealth generated by a growing middle class in developing nations, and that means there is more money and more savings in the world that is looking for a place to generate some yield. And interest rates, as we know, have been very, very low for a very long time now, so those options aren't, they aren't as preferable or they aren't as interesting as, let's say, the stock market is today. Is that part of the reason why we're seeing the stock market rebounding so quickly? Brian, take this on first. Money, as they say, essentially, you know, it just doesn't have as many places to go as it used to back in the day. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely true. And in fact, uh, there really is almost no place else for an investor to go uh, without uh, a high cost. You, the bond market is, is in a situation today where the, the safest bonds cost you money to buy them. If you try to buy uh, uh, most bonds issued by governments like Germany or Switzerland and even U.S. bonds, if you, if you look at real rates, uh, you're paying those governments uh, for the privilege of owning their bonds, which is sort of silly. Uh, you can buy, still buy corporate bonds, and if you get really good corporate bonds, they're very safe, but the interest rates are so low uh, that equities become the only game in town. And uh, the fact is that that's not just because of the pandemic. That's been true for a while. Francis, your view on that? Absolutely could not agree more. Let me give you the perspective of, you know, a large pension fund, for example. Now, a lot of the time we're talking about how you or I might decide to trade stocks at the end of the day or build our personal portfolios. But a lot of what happens in markets is driven by these large institutional managers pension funds and the like. Now, what happens is pension funds have to generate six, 7% return a year after fees, for example, after they account for inflation, they have to be able to make sure that they're paying their pensioners a certain amount. Here's the big problem. When interest rates are at or below zero and 25% of global government bonds are giving you negative yield. So as we just spoke about giving you less money back, if you need to generate that amount, that's your hurdle rate, you're going to have to go into other asset classes. You have no choice. That's the really big problem here. You have to put money to work and you have to generate a certain amount of yield. So you are going to see people who go out for further and further risk. That generally means equities, but it doesn't just mean equities. It means that we're probably going to see appetite for new asset classes that maybe were a little bit cringe before. I think this is one of the reasons things like Bitcoin get a lot of attention. But there's all the other areas like infrastructure funds or even investing in emerging markets. These are things that everyday Canadians maybe are not considering on the day to day that they're going to have to start thinking about. Hard assets, real estate is another area to go, even things like gold. So the traditional, you know, buy some stocks, buy some bonds, that's not going to work in this extremely low interest rate environment, particularly with interest rates that are this low and likely to be low for a very long time. Well, Brian, pick up on that, because I don't know that we've seen double-digit interest rates in three decades or so. Uh, can you imagine how long it will take to get back to that? It could be years and years. I mean, they're already talking about keeping interest rates rock bottom in, in key developed markets like the U.S., Europe, and Canada. 
Japan, uh, which has had zero rates for years. Uh, and uh, that really cuts uh, down uh, the markets you can venture into, even in terms of buying stocks. Uh, yes, you can get into infrastructure funds, you can buy you know, farmland in northern Saskatchewan, but there are high risks associated with that. And one of the risks is, what do you, how do you get rid of those things when you need to sell? Uh, the equity markets are, have a lot of capital, they're fluid, you can buy and sell pretty easily, they're flexible. Uh, and if you make the right decisions, you, you can at least approach the kind of returns you need uh, to keep your investors happy. So, Brian, are we in a bubble or no? Are we in a bubble? It depends what part of the market you're talking about. If you're talking about the Exxons of the world, there's no bubble. Uh, if you're talking about commercial real estate, if you're talking about transportation, there's no bubble in those sectors. There is a bubble in tech. Uh, it's not quite as crazy as the late 1990s when people were buying companies not only that had no profit, but they had no revenue. Uh, that's not the case today. Uh, the, the leading companies are profitable. They are producing big revenues, but they're not producing them at a level that would say this, sense, this investment at these prices makes sense. They are overbought, and that tends to be one of the definitions of a bubble, and all bubbles burst eventually, including this one. What's your view on that, Francis? Oh, well, here's the challenge is you can call for a bubble, but when does it burst? And my sense, probably only when we start to see interest rates start to rise. And in my forecast, I don't have any central bank raising interest rates for at least five years. And if I had a longer investment horizon, I'd probably extend it years out for that. So we are going to see volatility. You're more likely to see larger pullbacks occurring in the tech stocks. But I think the game here is not just to call the bubble, but really get a sense of timing the market, which is something that very few of us should be trying to do. It's extremely difficult. As I said earlier in the show, we want to focus on our longer term investment themes good entering opportunities on pullbacks uh, and really focus on where do you think these markets are going to be over the next three to five years? Because timing a bubble, um, it's, it's really tough. Okay. In our last couple of minutes here, I want to, um, I want to get a sense from each of you. To, to the best of my knowledge, investors like stability. Markets like stability. Uh, you know, they don't like wars around the world. They don't like surprises. They like stability. In which case, let me sort of put both of you on the spot here. Would a Trump re-election in November be stabilizing and therefore good for the markets? Or would more of this, let's just use a nice neutral term like disruptive behavior, uh, be injurious to the markets? Brian, what do you say? Well, the fact is that there used to be a view that uh, a Republican president was always better for the markets because they were business friendly, they got rid of regulations, uh, they made life easier on the tax side. And, and uh, Trump did that uh, early in his presidency. He cut taxes. He, he uh, took away some onerous regulations, at least onerous from the point of view of the Wall Street investment banks. And they were happy with that. Uh, but I'd say if you look at the recent market performance, they're basically saying, well, we don't really care about Trump and we don't care about Biden either because we don't think Biden's going to be a threat. If it had been a pr more progressive activist type uh, candidate for the Democrats, like Elizabeth Warren, who was not well liked on Wall Street, then I think you might have seen an adverse market reaction. Uh, Biden doesn't scare them. Uh, Trump may scare them, but they've learned to live with him over the last few years, and they've learned to live with the volatility. But overall, Trump has a, will have a much more negative effect on the markets going forward, especially if he continues his trade battles with China. Uh, and his pullback from international obligations, that, that's a big risk. Francis, last word to you. It's not that markets like stability, it's that they like predictability. They like to know what's going to happen next. And in that sense, Trump is a little bit devil you know. Yeah, maybe some things come out that we weren't expecting on a certain day, but we generally know, to, know his modus operandi. We know how he feels about China. We know how he feels about a variety of different functions. The truth is, when I walk into work every day, I'm not checking the polls on whether Biden or Trump win. I'm checking the polls on the Senate. Because what really matters to markets is not necessarily who wins the presidency, it's the composition of the government. If Trump wins re-election, for example, but he loses the Senate, then he won't have the ability to pass bills. The same is true for Biden. 
So generally markets actually like that mixed government. It means that you don't get any extreme policies through, you get middle of the road policies through, but we probably need to switch our focus away from who wins the presidency and its impact on markets to what does the total government look like? That could actually create some waves one way or another, depending on this. So focus on, uh, focus on the Senate in conjunction with the presidency race would be my number one advice on this topic. The more deadlocked they are in Washington, the happier Wall Street is. <laughs> okay, understood. Uh, Francis Donald, Brian Milner, that was just terrific. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight, and thank you for sharing your views. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.